Well, thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, yeah, the network is a computer once again. Let's get started here. I could I'd just like to mention, you know, today's International Women's Day. So for all of the women in the audience, I applaud you. And particularly uh, those that are in Egypt and the Middle East, I think, fighting for their freedoms. But let's get started here. So 1982, actually these four guys, Benoit Kuzla, Bill Joy, Annie Beckelstein, and Scott McNeely founded a company named after a university network. The Stanford University Network became known as Sun. And at that time, they joined actually the ranks of a number of companies who were looking at this, be it Apollo, Symbolics, and others, who were putting workstations on a network. And this was to compete against other mini computers and things like that, such as Vaxes, where there was centralized computing. Instead, this was now distributed computing. And this way, by putting them on a network, you could start to take advantage not only just of sharing information, but of putting other kinds of computers on that network and leveraging their power. At the same time as you're giving the individual user, the, particularly in the engineering cases, a high graphics and everything else that they needed for their jobs. They also moved and they recognized the importance of open standards and open APIs in terms of Unix and TCP IP. This gave them a significant advantage over their competitors as they started to develop out, as Berners talked about, an ecosystem of other players who could, who could contribute to this. So one of the things I wanted to go over today as a part of this talk is, this, is what is the effect of networks? And Ron Jingle had a good way of talking about this as being kind of network entropy. And what this really means is that networks in, in inevitably erode the structure of these monolithic systems by tearing the pieces apart and then reconnecting them. So that through a process of decomposition, distribution, and specialization and scale, now you can reform these molecules in essence to create, you know, by reintegrating these things and, and by re-expressing things to do new things. So we started to see other companies start to form, making routers and switches, Cisco most notably, uh, in terms of now connecting up networks themselves so that you can increase the power of the network even further. And then finally, John Gage came up with a tagline, I think, of, of that era, which is the network is the computer. And this was a real expression that distributed computing, and by tearing things apart, decomposing them, specializing them, and then reintegrating them, you could have much, much more powerful systems. And that's remained true today. And particularly then, we started seeing the dot-com era, the growth of the internet. And such that even you know, ordinary people started talking about networking protocols and, and terms such as HTTP and HTTP slash colon. Or TCP IP started becoming into the vernacular of ordinary, ordinary citizens. And today, of course, we're seeing the tremendous growth in the, in the number of network devices. So we're seeing on the order of these 5 billion devices that are connected today. And as we all know in this room, I'm sure that we're actually run out of the IPv4 addresses. Uh, so this is a real tribute to the power of what happens when you connect up all of these devices, and in essence, their need to become connected so that they can express a uh, kind of power. And in fact, there's even a larger cloud, I would say, on the horizon. And this is as we move out from data centers into the kind of devices, and mobile phones, smartphones around us, and laptops. But even further, I think the next 10 years or so, we'll see the growth of the enormous growth in the number of these, these devices that are measuring everything from the electricity going to your house or your washing machine or refrigerators or your second home, which is the automobile. And that now we're seeing over you know, 200 devices that are in your car. So you can think of, in fact, the car being, in essence, a mini cloud that's driving down the highway, perhaps talking to other cars through kind of a mesh network created ad hoc so that you can find out what the traffic is like up ahead. And so this is a real example of how the importance of the network and how important security becomes. Because as I'm driving down that highway, it might be great that my cars are talking to each other, but I certainly don't want anybody messing with my brakes or taking over my steering. So we need to have networks to be able to connect these things, but networks also to be able to make sure that these things are secure. So we're rapidly approaching these, these kind of huge, huge numbers. You know, trillion connected devices someday, a million applications. We've got over 300,000 today on the, on the iPhone already, uh, and, and a zettabyte of, of data. So I think cloud computing, as we'll discover, I think, in the next couple of days here, is, is arriving just in time. We're seeing, I often talk about this as being this kind of perfect storm that really is bringing it together and making cloud computing exactly right for this time. 
And also, I think the network has the effect of almost pulling apart these clouds. So there's a lot of discussion. We can debate whether there will be two or three large uh, cloud providers, such as we've just seen Amazon or Microsoft and, and others. Or will we start to see actually some of these, these clouds be pulled apart and coalesce around different areas, such as in media? Or we're seeing it in, in terms of the government clouds, financial services, all of these things that have specialized needs, particularly in terms of compliance. And yet they still want to be following the same model, the underlying model of cloud computing, which is where they're going to get uh, both the efficiency and the dramatic power. So another theme, I think, and part of this is this kind of architectural battle we're seeing around how applications are built uh, in a kind of distributed sense. On the enterprise, we've seen things that are mostly vertically scaled. We've got you know, high availability through a kind of simple failover model. And these are really only at modest scale, because to serve a particular business just doesn't need to get that big, transactional, and so forth. Whereas on the web side, we've seen a different approach. The enormous demand when you're serving a global market through the internet means that you have to look at horizontal scaling. Multiple, multiple layers of caching. We're adding more and more caching all the way from the processor down to storage. Models such as eventual consistency. Maybe we don't need to be transactional, have the exact price of precise information at all times. Uh, and that we're looking much more of a shared infrastructure model, and I think open APIs to, to address the, the needs of this growing ecosystem. And I think that the bottom line is the web one. The web one and the enterprise is now turning to the web for that model to understand how we should be building these applications. So I'm going to go through something here I think which most of us in this room already understand but it's often useful when you're explaining to someone else, which is why traditional data center approach really doesn't scale. And this has to do with the fact that we've tightly coupled applications into the infrastructure, and therefore complexity grows. It starts out very simple. You start out with a single application, you put it on an operating system, and you design sort of the configuration and from the physical servers and networks, and, and you're, you're okay. You now add another one. It has a slightly different requirements in terms perhaps of the operating system or the system configuration or the storage side that is needed for this. You keep going down the line and at each point you're making these kind of micro architectures, these micro systems that are within the same data center. So at the end of the day, you end up with something that actually has very inflexible infrastructure and very poor utilization, because each one of these applications is especially designed all the way down through the infrastructure. And there's no opportunity here to get the advantages of scaling, the efficiencies of automation, or anything else. So what do we do? As computer scientists, we always sort of like try to solve the problem by adding another level of indirection, it's sort of a classic approach that we do. Or you can think about it as adding another layers, and using layering to actually decouple one part of the system from another. And this is interesting. It's happened in a number of areas. We've seen it actually in the whole networking stack, for example. We have physical layers and all the way going up to the application layer. We've also seen it in terms of, of languages, such as Java, which created a new layer of abstraction, a virtual machine, which actually could allow an application to be independent of the underlying infrastructure and therefore become portable. Well, in this case, we're seeing cloud, I think, and particularly infrastructure as a service, as another one of those layers that really decouples applications from the underlying infrastructure. So, in the cloud computing model, it's really in the intent here is to create a service out of the infrastructure, out of a pool of resources, and use self-service and other kinds of ways to allow applications to access this, but let's keep the applications out of that infrastructure layer. That allows you to focus on that infrastructure layer and become highly efficient. Therefore, now we've decoupled the provisioning of applications from the provisioning of the infrastructure itself. So as more infrastructure is needed, it can be added into the pool of resources, but it's not tied directly to one of these applications. Instead, the applications can come, and they can go, as you're managing the infrastructure. So this is model exactly shown like in a private, so-called private cloud area, which is really, I think, most effectively done when people recognize what they need to do is turn their infrastructure into a service. So in essence, using the cloud computing model inside of a data center, and then they have to be able to treat it like they would a service provider in order to get the efficiencies. And when you start to do that, I think that that becomes the new computing platform. That means that applications now really are insulated from this lower layer. The lower layer can evolve independently of the applications 
and it can be highly automated and driven out, you know, run like a service and should be measured that way in order for you to get the efficiencies of it. So this holds true both for now service providers and for the enterprise, so the public and private cloud share a common model. This makes it possible, and over time, if this was in an enterprise, to take these applications now that have been re-architected to work in this environment and now run these out in the cloud itself. So this, I think, comes into this other aspect of networking, which is now distributed processing, which is that there really is a revolution in how applications are being built, and Vern has touched upon some of this. So now we have this IAS layer. That is the new cloud platform, and upon which you build applications. Well, some of those applications directly serve an end user. Others actually are a service. And others can be ganged together so that you can create another platform as a service. This means applications now are built on top of those. They become yet another platform. And increasingly, we're seeing now applications using APIs interacting with each other on top of this platform. In essence, this is SOA done right, or it finally gets real, as we have platforms built on top of platforms built on top of platforms. And then, uh, of course, it seems to be turtles all the way down. So lastly, I'd just like to touch upon then what Cisco is sort of doing in this area. So first and foremost, as an infrastructure provider, we're here to help customers architect, build, and deploy cloud-based services. Uh, it's really nice for us to talk about how great it is to use cloud. When you're actually building a cloud, it really requires some fundamental architectural understanding. Uh, it also requires some building blocks. So we, for example, have a UCS uh, model unified computing system, which is built upon a fabric model that allows it very quickly to bring up new services. You're essentially now building racks at a time, managed by an API. And that's a very important part because that means you can start to automate these systems. We also work with many of our partners to integrate their solutions to make it easier and quicker for, for people to deploy IAS or other kinds of hosted collaboration environments. The second big area is, and naturally we've been involved with standards all along, that's key to making networking happen, but also in terms of working with open source communities. Most recently, we joined the OpenStack community, and I've got engineers now back at Cisco who are working on that as we're helping to define sort of the next generation of networking APIs that would make use to make drive that, that platform. Lastly, I think we're continuing to drive sort of making this network into a platform is something John Chambers has been talking about for quite a while. Cloud computing, I think, makes that statement real. We can really start to look at this networking as a platform. That means we need to really start talking about what are the APIs required to essentially manage the network as a system. It's no longer enough to manage individual devices. You really need to take a system approach and use the APIs in terms of, of, of getting access to that. The other thing is that there's, a, you know, actually now I think networking is, is undergoing a radical change. And we're looking at a lot of different alternative models and different approaches for building the kind of networking infrastructure that we want for these virtualized multi-tenant clouds. Uh, running it on a shared infrastructure, that means that we have to understand how to now virtualize the network itself, slice it up into different components, perhaps dealing independently with the control plane and data planes. All of these things is going to actually change networking in the future. So with that, I'd like to close and simply say again that the network is a computer, once again, but we're just at the beginning. So thank you very much.